This is Sting, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside. Come inside. It is your host, James Walsh, joined as always by Mr. Patrick Kelly. Howdy, howdy. And Mr. Nick Knoll. Well, someone please feed that Ryback guy by now. I'm sick and tired of hearing him complain. I'll tell you, he don't look that hungry. I mean, he don't look that no, hungry. he's the big hungry. That's his name. He's the big hungry. Yeah. That sounds like a value meal at McDonald's. Yes, it does. It reminds me of when they brought in Big Show. Remember when they first brought in Big Show and he was named the Big Nasty? Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, not kidding. That was really Big Show's name when they first brought him to the WWF. I'm not, yes. I'm not kidding. It was the Big Nasty. By the way, did you realize why they called him the Big Show? Why? Initials. Figure it out. Is that seriously why they did it? Yes. Yep. Well, it was the Attitude Era. And Vince Russo loves puns. Like, PMS, that was his. Yeah, pretty much. Right. This, this TB, the big show was TBS, so it was kind of being sarcastic to that. His original name was going to be the Titanic, and that's why on his last appearance on WCW, Bischoff went on this big rant at the end of it. The Titanic just sank and things like that. That was the gimmick they had lined up for him. And uh, there you go. Wow. All I know is right has someone to feed Tenzai less. <laughs> Maybe you should eat Tenzai. Oh, my. You sure I can't pick him up. Yeah. Which, ladies and gentlemen, I have gotten this show off completely on the wrong foot, and I'm the one that always complains about staying on topic. All right. All right. So, All right, so here we are. Um, we're a couple days removed from what Nick posted, and I'm not sure if it was the afterglow of the, frankly, really good show or if it's going to hold up uh, one of the pay-per-views of the year I mean it was a really good show I don't know how it came across on TV as much live I did watch the tape back and yes Nick I did order it on TV at home and record it as well as attend I got to tell you I blew quite a bit of money this on this event uh, but it was an enjoyable Damn. yeah I, I watched it and it's a good show on TV I don't know how it came across live but TV doesn't do it justice in terms of the sheer energy that was in that arena. And i got to tell you, all the fears I had, I attended, if I haven't made that clear, I was in the crowd, all the fears I had about how well they would draw, the fact that they very much did not do promotion in the local area. They did commercials on, t on um, local radio and a couple television spots, but not really you know, blitzing the media circuit over here. It was pretty well attended. I'm not saying it was a sellout because it wasn't, but I've seen some people try to say, oh, well, they moved people around to make it look like there was more people than there were there. No, that's not true. Um, there was a section that was half empty, and that was on the hard camera side, so it, you wouldn't, really wouldn't see it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was. that's exactly what... Uh, I mean, they didn't move anybody. That's just the way the tickets were sold. But it was a very, a very, very packed... Um, Packed building, a hell of a lot of energy. Uh, basically, I said it, and I'll stick by it. It was a bunch of nitwits, nerds, and uh, misfits that were in the crowd, and I'm probably all three of those. But they were, you know, it was just an impressive, impressive reaction. I mean, for God's sakes, we were singing Rob Van Dam's theme song, such as it is. How much more can you ask than that? Yeah. I actually heard you guys. I, I remember thinking, it's like, wow, they're actually singing the theme song. That's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, you know, we'll get this out of the way right now. Uh, and we're going to go through a whole rundown of the card. But I just want to, you know, James have his little fanboy moment here. How cool was it to see Hulk Hogan live for you? Because this is the first time that you've ever seen Hogan live. I know you're a huge fan of his. So I just want to get how awesome was it for you to see him live? Well, the first time he was live was during the pre-show. And, by the way, the pre-show for the live crowd sucked. There was that's the only time I'm on camera or any of us are on camera is actually during the pre-show, but um, 
the pre-show sucked. They did nothing in the arena. It was not even like an intro for Taz or, or, or today. Um, it just was a, a show. You know, it, there was nothing to see. It was just on the on the big screen there. So for the live crowd, there was no reason to show up an hour early. Um, with, oh. with that said, how cool? Hi, Nick. How you doing? With how cool was it to see Hogan? Well, he first appeared on the on the big screen for the JB interview during the pre-show. And then he wasn't on at all until, you know, when he came out. And I was starting to think, oh, no, 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 no. They're going to go the whole show, and he's not even going to make an appearance in the arena. This is the honest to God's truth, and I know you guys might not believe me. When his music hit, I could still feel a tingle in my right ear from the amount of audio blast that hit me from the audience. I mean, it was... Yeah! right in your freaking ear it was insane and yes I screamed too but I was actually stunned by the emotional screaming reaction it was unlike any reaction I've ever heard it was just stunning and uh, so yeah that was amazing you know I was of course going completely bonkers with it and um <laughs> I was laughing my ass off, though, because they did leave it too long at the end of that segment. We'll get to this in a minute. But the crowd, I don't know if you heard it, but if you were trying to figure out what they were chanting before they cut to JB, this we is started, awkward. This is awkward, because they just kept standing there staring at each other. It's like, okay, do something else. It's like, And I felt the same way, too. Watch, it's like, all right, guys, cut. Cut. It's time to cut. <laughs> you know. but, In the crowd, yeah. it just felt like, okay, well, I, I just kept saying, you know, well, Maybe Bubba's going to do something and they'll all come back out or something like that. But no, it just kind of was like, uh, do something then, this guy's. There was no exit strategy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's great to hear that you had a good time. And uh, I guess now would be as good a time as any to actually go down the card and see what we thought of everything. The show opened up with... Rob Van Dam versus Zima Ion for the X Division title, where Rob Van Dam won the X Division title. Uh, yeah, redundant statement is redundant. Uh, so, uh, what did you guys think of this match? First off, I got to give big credit to Rob Van Dam for his willingness to let Zima look good in this match. A lot of times when you see this situation in any company, the idea is, well, God, the name guy's got to really look good here. The name guy's got to be the one that lands most of the offense or the people won't care. And Rob, for the most part, let Zima control that match, and he looked good. And, and there were some really cool spots in this match. And, you know, I, I said this before the pay-per-view. Win, lose, or draw, this is huge for Zima Ion because the more casual fans who maybe don't watch TNA week to week but are RVD fans and tune in when he's on – are going to find out who he is. And I really feel like this was a good match for him to have. Uh, I agree with putting the belt on RVD for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it, it really got the crowd excited. This was a very good opening match. What you wanted to do is get the people excited and really get those juices flowing. Um, number two, RVD, you know, it, it, it's almost a redundant statement now because everyone says it, but Rob Van Dam was X Division before there was an X Division. And number yeah, I mean, three, I, I wrote a big post about that, yeah. And number three, the X Division title hasn't meant a whole lot in a very long time. There is a lot of potential with Rob Van Dam as the champion. My fingers are crossed here that now that he has the belt, that's going to mean more regular matches for the X Division. That's going to mean uh, you know, a heightened sense of awareness for the division as a whole because you do have this guy – that is a big part of TNA's marketing strategy. He has a very big name that people recognize who is now the champion. And, you know, I like Zima. I think he, I think he's done as well of a job as he can do given the circumstances that he's in. But, you know, this isn't like, this shouldn't be taken as, oh, my God, they dropped this poor kid out because, to, make, to have a, a battle for glory moment for Rob Van Dam. It was a very good match, and I, I give that kid credit for working hard. I give Rob uh, RVD credit for his for he always brings it at the big shows. There are times where I feel like he kind of phones it in at the smaller shows, but he definitely brought it again and found for glory. And those are my thoughts. Patrick, what do right, you James? think of it? Well, okay, I'll go. Um, honestly, in the live crowd, I could tell you that there was a huge contingent of former ECW fans, and I was very shocked to hear that because. 
ECW very rarely traveled west of the Mississippi. Um, I can only uh-huh. think of a handful of times that they actually did. I mean, they know they did the arena, the uh, the Los Angeles show, the Heat Wave show, where a uh, big brawl happened because one of the drunken XPW guys groped Francine. Uh, but I don't remember much else uh, about them traveling west of the Mississippi. So I was surprised to hear that. And I did silence some of those chants, uh, by the way. I kind of said, you're 11 years too late, and things like that, and got the grumbles. Oh, but the spirit lives on, man. Things like that from the so, whatever. That said, I wasn't surprised to hear RVD's reaction. I mean, it was huge. He was the first guy out of the starting gates, and uh, you know the the talk in the crowd. And I I tried to like have my ear to the crowd to hear what people were mumbling and talking about and, and talking amongst themselves. And everybody was saying, "Oh, this kid isn't even in the same league," and things like that. And you know, they were surprised and 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 and. and I'm not going to say, you know, that he won them over because that wasn't his intention. But I think that they realized that he was better than they gave him credit for going in. And by him, I'm referring to Zima Ion. Uh, So I think he left in a better position with people realizing that he's a good talent than when he went into the match. And, uh, yeah, I think Rob Van Dam should be the X Division champion because, like you said, he's more likely to end up on TV, thus bringing the X Division to the TV than Zima Ion is. Realistically, I think they were holding out hope that Sorensen would be healthy enough by Bound for Glory for the big payoff. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. I don't know what his status is, but um, you know, obviously that we're going to get that match, and that's going to happen, and hopefully Zima will be champion by the time that does happen, but in the meantime, we can't just leave it dormant until then, so it's a good move to put the belt on RVD. I also so, say this. Okay, and... Uh... I already posted my feelings on the match in my YouTube video that I posted today, so I won't go into too much detail. But I do agree with you both. I did enjoy this match. It was a really solid opener. So next match was for the TV title. It was Samoa Joe defending against Magnus. And I thought this was a pretty solid match. I know, James, you said that this was uh, – it didn't come across this way on TV, but you said in a post on your Facebook page that this was one of the parts that the crowd was dead for. I wouldn't say dead, but – Considering how hyped up they were for the, if I had to pick two matches where the audience wasn't that crazy, I'd say it was the the, the knockouts title match and this match. Uh, both of them were kind of a subdued reaction. There was chance, and I'll give it that. I can't deny that. But it, it was sounded a, like, again. This is how it came across on TV. It sounded like they were at the very least they were into Joe. They liked Joe. Oh yeah, no, they loved Joe. I can't deny that. It just wasn't. Uh, they weren't as into it as they were with some of the other matches. I wasn't as into it either. <laughs> but that's oh, I don't want. <laughs> oh, okay. James Walsh didn't like a Samoa Joe segment. Color me stunned. Next, you're going to tell me he doesn't like Obama. Yeah, I'm not watching. I don't think anybody on this phone likes Obama. I'm not watching the. Uh, I'm not watching the debate, but I'm watching. I, I did watch for a few seconds, and I saw. He really, all I'll say about this, and this is the only political comment I'll make, he really don't like to be challenged on his record, does he? Well, I say, I'll say this, and then we'll, we'll drop the political stuff. He has this how dare you challenge me on anything face that just comes out whenever anyone points out anything, even in like a press conference. He gets asked like a tough question that isn't one of those, oh, Mr. President, you know, blah, 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 blah. It, you know, it's a tougher question. He gets this, like, look on his face of, how dare you say that to me? And I, I, we'll stop now. Um, getting back to the match at hand, I thought it was a very good match. I'll agree with James that it wasn't as over-the-top excited from what I what came across on TV. Um, you, you know, I wouldn't say, I don't think they were necessarily uh, dead. I know he didn't say it was dead. Uh, I liked this match. It was kind of, it, well, the S-Division match was a spot fest, high-flying match. This is kind of a more, we're going to, you know, do kind of more old-school style wrestling with power moves and suplex, things like that. And, and, and Matt Wrestling, too, and Matt Wrestling, too. And, and people, actually, to their credit, liked it, but it just seemed like they weren't as... It, it was clearly the set, the, the, the letdown factor from the first match as well, and right. the lead-in factor to the match after this as well. So, I mean, it was clearly right. put in there for that purpose, you know, matchmaking and uh, sequencing-wise, right. it was clearly done for that purpose, and they got the desired you know, result. I liked, I, personally, I really liked the finish, because I thought it was a great example of kind of how you play with someone's expectations. 
like one of Magnus's favorite moves is to shoot a guy into the ropes, duck under, come back with a short short clothesline. You saw he went for that joke hot because he had done it so many times in the match. So he went for the he went for the choke. Magnus got out of that. Uh, I think it was Joe went for the muscle buster. Magnus avoided it. Then they did Joe got the choke again. They did the Bret Hart Roddy Piper spot from WrestleMania. And you're thinking, oh, that's how they're going to do it. One, two, Joe kicks out. He injures his knee. Uh, they're going for the the figure four. They're saying, okay, this is going this is going to drag on a little bit more. I, well, and then Joe gets him in the choke, and that's it. I mean, I, I like I, I like when wrestling plays with our expectations, and it's not just it's not just the five moves of doom sequence that everybody does. It's not you know repeated. I, I like I like playing with that. I'll say it was a very very good match. Uh, uh, apparently, Mike Johnson, who claims he watched the whole pay per view, cannot tell the difference between title belts because he reported today that TNA is still using the old world uh, world heavyweight championship. Yeah, and he's, they did on the first night where Joe won the belt, but no, you're wrong. Yeah. That's TV title. But um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I thought this was a good match as well. But uh, did you want to say something else, Nick? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, next match was, and I think I speak for everybody on the line when I t- uh, think of what Joe and Magnus. I thought it was a good match. English brutal. It was solid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the next match, and I think I speak for everybody on the line when I say this: match of the night, no question. Uh, James Storm versus Bobby Roode in a street fight. Uh, awesome, awesome freaking match. I love it. Holy shit! I, yeah, that, hey, that pretty much sums it up. I think the best way to say it is just thank you. Thank you, James wow. Storm. Thank you, Bobby Roode. That was a pleasure to watch as a wrestling fan, and it was it was everything that it needed to be. The one year in the making, all the, the brutality of it, just, I mean, my God, the amount of blood James Storm lost in this match. I mean, I mean, I got to give him credit because he did something I almost never see any, uh, another wrestler do when they're bleeding like that. He actually sold it like he was having problems standing up because, oh, yeah, he's lost so much blood, it's hard for him to see and move. You know, we saw little stumbles out of there. Uh, uh, one thing I liked was they kept, went during, after someone hit a big move, a couple times they cut to King Mo, who was on the outside, and he legitimately had this look on his face every time of, Jesus Christ, what am I getting myself into here? Yeah, DDT, um, right after he did the DDT, the Randy Orton DDT, but on the ramp, uh, well, he cut to King Mo's face. The look on his face was like, what the hell am I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what about the thumbtacks? I mean, that shocked me. I didn't think they were going to pull that out of the hat. And I was like, oh, dear Lord. Then, you know, you're looking at this. Both guys are shirtless and wearing the... The, the Speedos. Tidy whitey. Yeah, the Speedos. And I'm like, this is not going to end well for somebody. <laughs> this is, well, my this funniest is part, though, so, not, not only after Bobby Roode takes the spot, but then James Storm goes and does the elbow drop. And he gets them stuck on his thigh, and I don't know how how it came across on TV as much, but in person, you could see him pop up and grimace in agony because he didn't expect to get those in his thigh at that point. Yeah, I, I guys have got to be. Are, if they wrestle on Impact this week, I I'm going to be in utter amazement because both guys have got to still be feeling the effects of this one. I mean. And the thumbtacks, because we haven't seen a fist this much this year, we haven't seen that spot at all. You know, that was almost a trademark of every abyss pay-per-view match. The thumbtacks would come out. Uh, you know, definitely, you know, just an incredible match. And I, I liked the way that they, they summed up the finish, where it was Rube got the, the beer bottle, and you're like, well, this is where it all started. You know, he cracked a beer bottle over Storm's head and it stole the world title, and it was, Storm, you know, just kind of cracking him in the head with the beer bottle. And I wish that, that one, one little complaint, this isn't the guy's fault, it isn't really even TNA's fault, but the microphones or whatever did not pick up what James Storm said to Bobby Roode. And kind of like how Shawn Michaels mouthing, I love you and I'm sorry when he, when he ended Ric Flair's career, I think that would have added just a little, right. little, little to the match. He would have sort of said, I loved you like a brother or... This, this ends now, and then he hits the big, uh, you know, last call, send Storm back, uh, Rude back into the thumbtacks, and uh, one, two, three. It, what an incredible match. Uh, 
I would hate to be the people that had to follow that matchup. And that was really, yeah, was, you know, that was really awe-inspiring as a fan to see these guys really do it. I mean, you're looking at James Storm's face at the end of the match, and you're thinking, "Good, all right." I know you're going to do the beer bash and all that stuff, but go back and get some stitches, pal, because you're you're you let a boatload here. I mean, I, was, I felt bad for him, but he really put it out there. Well, by the way, if you go to our Facebook page, that is our cover photo right now. It's just a photo of James Storm during the match, and just the as Vince McMahon would say, the old crimson mask. Yeah, yeah, it was. Excellent, oh, yeah, the excellent, Gordon excellent. Yep, Gordon Soley started that one. Yeah. Crimson Mask. Gordon yeah. Soley, there's a name out of the past. But, uh, yeah, that was an excellent match, match of the night. We all in agreement of that? At the very yeah. Crimson Mask. Ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, the next match, the poor unfortunate souls that had to follow that match were Al Snow and Joey Ryan. And, uh, we got to see Ed. That was pretty cool, and I think the right guy went over as well, so no harm done. Perfect Sunday evening always has head involved in it. Yes, exactly. You know, um, I'll give Mike these guys... Mike gets called tonight, by the way. He grabbed the... Uh, t- Michael, uh, t- uh, Taz says to Michael Cole, well, looks like Al Snow's looking for head. And I don't know why I always make him sound like Barney Rubble, but I do. And That's kind of how he talks. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, yeah. here comes the pain, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he goes ahead. He goes down and he grabs it from the, underneath the ring and said, "Mike Tanay says, boy, if I only would have known it was that easy." But I thought that was a great call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this match? Ahead. Yeah. Jelly is one easy son. Joke met with silence. <laughs> I like this match. Well, I'm just going to say, I really like this match. Obviously, it's not going to be one of those that anyone's going to remember very long term unless you're a big Joey Ryan fan or a big Al Snow fan. Uh, but you know what? Given the spot they were in and what they had to do, they had a very entertaining match. It, they, they clearly knew why they were being sent out there at that spot. It's like, okay, guys. We need a popcorn match. We need a match people can kind of get their senses back from because of what what was the third match on the card. So they got in, and I, I liked it. I'm glad to see Joey's getting the opportunity. He's a very entertaining wrestler. It's great to see him now have a chance in TNA. And you know what? We talked. We just talked about how they need some more guys in the X division to help it to get showcased. And there's a guy right there. So. Uh, hopefully they do have a plan for Joy Ryan. Uh, Matt Morgan came back after the match. I don't think anybody cares, though. Nobody did. I, I'm going to be honest with you. There was no pop. It wasn't even like a, you son of a bitch, you screwed out. It was just kind of like a, oh, him. <laughs> Reaction. And, uh, I, and that's truthful. And my, my 11-year-old son, Nikki, said to me, who's that guy? And I said, that's Matt Morgan. And my 3-year-old and people who are offended by bad language, please listen away. My three-year-old said, no, it's not. It's fuckhead. <laughs> I, I'm not making that up either. That's entirely true. Why, why did he call Matt Morgan fuckhead? I don't know. I don't even know where you would have heard that. The only person I'd ever called a fuckhead in my entire life was my seventh grade math teacher who I grew to love. So I don't know where he got it from. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm sorry, but I refuse to believe that with you for a father, that you, that your son has never heard the term fuckhead. I've said it. I've obviously let the F word slip here and there, but I don't recall ever saying the words F and head together. Well, for, okay, now, <laughs> now I'm wondering if perhaps, if perhaps your wife has ever said the words, your father is such a fuckhead to your sons. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> Probably so. But yeah, that was that was uh, that was the saving grace uh, uh, of Matt Morgan's return for me is that I laughed my ass off hearing him say that, and then I had to reprimand him for swearing. But the people behind <laughs> us in the seats thought it was hysterical. So I, I, I bet, I bet. Uh, but yeah, that's a really awesome. See, you don't get that if you're not at the live shows. You get to hear awesome stories like that. Yeah. 
All right, so what, what was the next so, match? Uh, oh. Next match was the triple threat tag team title match of AJ Styles and Kurt Angle versus Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez versus the champions, uh, Christopher Daniels and Kazarian. And I have not read any reports. Is Kazarian okay? Real quick, um, real quick, real quick. We were quick. We brought head, by the way. You what? We brought head. When we were in the crowd, we had head in the crowd. Oh, cool. So, yeah. If you notice, when he first makes the entrance, he's facing our way, and he finally picks his hands up and starts doing the head symbol. I think he probably saw us vehemently doing head chant. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, Patrick, from what I've heard, his shoulder is extremely sore, but otherwise, Kazarian is fine. That was a sickening thud. Yeah, that, that was a sickening thud. Well, w- one thing I think this card had was it had a little bit for almost everybody. If you're kind of a, a more catch-as-catch-can wrestling fan, you got that. If you're a hardcore wrestling fan, you got that. If you're a fan of spot fest matches, you certainly got that in this match where it seemed like everyone was like, oh, you can do that? What what, what I can do? Unfortunately for Kazarian, it damn near nearly killed him at one point. Yeah. AJ is crazy too, by the way. Well, duh. I mean, it, for a while there, it seemed like uh, lockdown was just an excuse to have AJ climb on top of the lethal lockdown and jump off or through the cage. Yeah. Oh, oh God. The year when he went through the cage and nobody caught him, I was like, oh. <laughs> like, and, of course, that was the last time AJ ever did that. Yeah. Which, by the way, if you've ever watched that, just read Booker T's body language there because he's like, oh, shit, what did we just do? Now, that's for yeah. veterans right there. You'd think that, you know, uh, they'd be better prepared for that. <laughs> but, oh, well. Which, yeah, definitely if you like high flying and, you're, you know, you like those real spot fest matches, go see this because it seemed like everybody did something. I mean, freaking Hernandez, you know, took flight. Uh, AJ did that spot where he was, it looked like he was going to go for the springboard 450, and then he jumps up on the rope, he bounces over to the other rope, to hit the Fallsbury flop on you know, everybody else, which fortunately this time people caught him. Yeah, yeah, and that was the spot I was talking about. That was like, he's crazy. Like, I, and I'll give him credit, that was one of the first times where that spot where, you know, one guy, and you see this a lot in like cruiserweight matches now, but uh, where the guys will start piling up outside the ring and then they'll just keep diving onto the pile one at a time, and i really gotten kind of sick of that spot. But this time it really worked because I didn't see AJ doing that. Uh, I, I didn't see that coming, so it just kind of shocked me. Yeah. And um, I pray to God above that this was the end, this is the end of Kazarian, AJ, and Daniels and any type of feud with each other. I, I seriously I hope not. Well. I don't yeah. know. There's yeah. a lot of infomercial chicks in there that they got to impregnate. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, uh, well, they already inserted olive oil into the segment, so they've got to get, like, I don't know, Morticia Adams. Or Stop that he giving wrote. them ideas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you you yeah. wouldn't want to see William... You wouldn't want to see Betty Rubble get impregnated? Barney couldn't even do that. <laughs> Taz couldn't get her pregnant? <laughs> Hey, well, he could try. It's a challenge. <laughs> now, it was a really nice, serious discussion we had going about pro wrestling there for a while. Now we're completely off the track. Tracks. We're so, I have no idea how we're going to get back to where we were talking about. Uh, um, what was the, next on the card? Uh, the, uh, by the way, the big, one of the biggest pops of the night came at the end of this match. And I'll be honest with you, I think the crowd was kind of like, well, at least Kaz and, and Daniels didn't win, but we were rather AJ and Angle won. Angle was over like Rover, by the way. He got a huge pop, um, as did AJ. I mean, I popped huge for AJ because, frankly, you know, there's an original guy right there. You got to you got to give it up for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, those guys, the, AJ and and and, uh, and Angle were clearly the most over team in the match. People just seemed, to, you know, oh well, at least at least Daniels and Kaz didn't win um, when. 
Chavo dedicated the match to Eddie at the end. The crowd was one of the more uh, emotional pops of the night. And I will say there was quite a few Eddie Guerrero memori- memorial T-shirts in the mm-hmm. crowd that the WWF had put out, WWE had put out in uh, 2005 after he passed. So it was met with a good reaction. Right. And um, yeah. like I, I'll give it, I'll give it a chance. I mean, I think the tag team division, it has some parts there that it, it, it needs to be rebuilt. And I, I frankly feel, and this is why I'm hopeful that we have finally seen the end of AJ, Kaz, and Daniels in some type of feud, because now Daniels and Kazarian, if they want to get their titles back, they got to go after Hernandez and Chavo. And AJ right, and, and we can, yeah, AJ and Kurt are free to go do other things finally. Yes, yes, and uh, and hopefully that's the case because uh, you know AJ and Angle, I mean, uh, they're great in just about anything they do, but uh, you know you prefer to see them as singles as opposed to a team together. So, yeah, um, but yeah, that was a really good match. I really enjoyed that. I'll say this: I'd be fine with them teaming. The problem just is, and you said it perfectly, Pat. We've seen the AJ Daniels feud so many times, and we've seen every match conceivable between the two. There's nothing left to see. It's over. It's not fresh. It's not original. And even if they go out there and they have a great match, like, we've seen it before. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, really enjoyed that match as well. Uh, another uh, one of the stronger matches on the card, actually. But next we had the knockout title match between Miss Tessmacher and Tara, which was okay-ish. Match. Uh, it's the only match um, I went to the bathroom for, and it wasn't to insult the girls. It was that my my three year old, after the noise, was starting to get kind of fed up, and, and he kept asking to go to the bathroom, so I took him. Um, uh, I it it was the lowest like, crowd reaction of the night. I will say that. I, I feel like this match got a lot of time cut from it. Just the way, just watching it unfold the way that it did, I feel like something had to run long. And they're like, look, girls, we're sorry, but we're not going to take time away from the main event. We have to cut it from your match. Uh, I, I just feel like the crowd had to be exhausted again, too, because you had, like, you had, I'll say, three matches that were like, wow, you know, like, we really got the crowd excited. Uh, the, the street fights, the tag title match, and then I felt like the main event, for the most part, got people pretty excited. Unfortunately, the match, is, there has to be some lull. You know, we always talk about the popcorn match, the match to let people right. it was, recover. It was Trish against Lita. It was Trish against Lita from WrestleMania 18. It was like nothing against the match, but to follow Hogan and Rock, eh, not going to happen. Yeah. Well, Jazz was in that match, too. Nobody remembers that. She actually won the match. But... Did she? Wow. <laughs> See, there you yeah. Go. But, uh, yeah, this match was okay-ish for what it was. The part I didn't like was after the match when Tara won the belt, which I'm fine with that. But who the hell is that guy? Um, apparently, he's a trained wrestler. Like, uh, like they talked about him being on Big Brother and stuff, but apparently, he's been trained to wrestle. Like he's right, kind of OBW. People started chanting, "Who?" Uh, well, let's not mix words. I started chanting, "Who are you?" And by the time the video package came for the Sting um, Hall of Fame ceremony. Everybody was chanting it. It was like a deafening, who are you, who are you chant. It was the only thing that got over that entire night. And I started that, so I take a little pride in that. Unfortunately, it didn't make the TV cut. <laughs> well, for those, for those that do not know, this guy is, uh, his name's like Jesse Gozzard. He is a trained wrestler. He's actually been under contract to TNA. He was one of the first guys they sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling when they got the deal with OVW. Um, I... I mean, I don't know. I, I personally thought it was going to be Joey Ryan was going to be revealed as her boyfriend. Because, I, I don't know, I guess I just connected Joey's from California. She keeps saying Hollywood. Um, so, uh, I don't think people are going to care that much. I mean, hopefully this guy's decent in the ring. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens ultimately. I, I personally don't think they were playing it to get this huge pop and, like, get all this, you know, to... to I think they were trying to play like oh, it, 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 it's it's if they were. Well, I think they're trying to play it up as if she's developed a huge ego and she's a little delusional. Hmm. By the way, uh, going on to the next thing a little bit here, there was a little bit of a gasp in the crowd when people saw Luger on the video screen. Yeah. Like, 
what the hell happened to him? And, and I said and kind of got a little bit of a laugh around it. He's like, oh, my God, karma didn't just kick its ass, kick his ass. She threw him down the flight of stairs. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, so, yeah, that was, uh, I was a little bit of a smart ass, if you couldn't tell. Just the one time that you've ever been a smart ass, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, next up was the Aces and Eights, I think, right? Aces and Eights versus Sting and Bully Ray. And uh, a couple of things I want to say about this. Number one, Bully Ray is awesome. Number two, uh, Joseph Park is one of the best characters in wrestling. And uh, number three, I'll, I'll give him credit. I was legit shocked of the reveal of one of the members of the Aces and Eights. Right. Um, it was, uh, the, the setup of it, I was very much expecting it to be Brutus Beefcake again. It was very, <laughs> the end, where Hogan pulled the mask off, it was, it was very reminiscent of Halloween Havoc 94 when he pulled the mask off the guy. And it was like, it's Brother Brutus, and here comes the avalanche. Uh, that would have been horrible. But, uh, that would have been terrible. But no, it's uh, Devon is a member of the Aces and Eights, and they won, so they're going to be a regular presence on the show now, which I think we all knew that was coming. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was legit shocked. I was kind of like, I was expecting like you know something that we've seen a million times, like Bischoff or Jarrett, and I was like, okay, that's a little interesting. Let's see where they go with this. I'm intrigued. You have I my attention. I was happy with Jarrett, actually. The crowd, when Jeff Jarrett came on the video screen one time, the crowd booed, you know, ridiculously. And I thought, you know, how could a guy who's not been on TV in over a year now get one of the better bad guy boos of the night? I mean, that was, he would have been perfect to fit in there. But, yeah, nope. I mean, that was uh, Jeff Jarrett. Wait. When did Jarrett come on the video screen? Might have been during the pre-show. They showed they were showing clips of something, and they had Jeff Jarrett's. Uh, it was a clip of an old match, and as she mentioned Jeff. I think it was uh, Dixie Carter, one of Dixie Carter's babbling segments, and she said something about that. And when Jeff Jarrett started this company, and the crowd went boo, boo, like really ridiculously so. All right. Well, well I thought, how is wow. so over? Match was um, very good. Uh, I, 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 two things I liked. Um, the little thing Sting and Bully Ray did. I liked Bully painting his face and Sting wearing a Bully Ray T-shirt to kind of show team unity. I, I, I like little touches like that. It just kind of makes sense. And you even saw that back in the old NWA when guys were team with Sting or the Road Warriors. They might paint their face too. Um, like Ruffy the Dusty. The two guys that uh, worked as Ace and Ace, which from what I understand, it was Luke Gallows and the former Mike Knox. Although it could have actually been Ryan Braddock or Jay Bradley or Bradley Jay. Um, a guy, a big guy that you know WWE had under contract but gave like two seconds of TV time to and said, oh, he doesn't have it. Um, I thought they worked pretty well. I agree that it, it legitimately shocked people. And I've actually seen some response online that is like angry and not like not like angry and that it's a stupid twist, angry and that D, how could Devon do this to the fans? <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, yeah. Oh. I mean so it's cool to get a reaction like and again, like I said, everybody was expecting kind of a stupid Eric Bischoff thing, especially after that segment on Impact a couple weeks ago. And they did the uh, worst job ever disguising somebody's voice. Well, James, <laughs> he might as well have gone, beep, 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 it's not Eric Bischoff. Beep, 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 beep. I mean, that, it was horrible. James, I well, we all knew it was Eric. James, I kind of think that was on purpose to mislead people, to get them think. Because in that same segment, he goes, my identity right now isn't important to you. I think that I, it's the same way where Hogan, for like months on Twitter, has been putting Devon over saying, and brothers, I don't know how TNA let this drop. Devon's too good of a main event player to let go. I'm going to take care of this. You know, like every single day for the last few months, it seems like Hogan's been putting over Devon. And now you're kind of like going back in your mind. You're like, oh, shit. This might have been planned out all along. Yeah. Well, I think it obviously was planned all along. I mean, I, they, yeah, they totally worked us here. So um, kudos for that. 
And again, going back into our expectations, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Bully Ray coming out the Sting base bait and everything. A lot of people were expecting Bully Ray to screw over Sting. I think that's why people kept, kept chanting at the end that it was awkward, because I think we were all kind of saying, okay, well, now it's Devon, maybe Bubba's going to do something, and it just kept, it kind of felt like that prolonged uh, segment in Austin Powers where the bad guys are going, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it just was kind of just too long of the how long can we stand here looking at each other shocked kind of thing. Right. Right, right. But uh, otherwise, you know, I thought the match was really entertaining. Uh, again, uh, like I said before, I, I really liked the Joseph Park character. He's he's the perfect nerd character. Like, whenever he he gets his revenge on somebody, it is so satisfying. It's like I, I really like this character. <laughs> Well, I, I'm telling you, there was a lot of people in the crowd who were expecting him, once he went back to the back before the end of the match, uh, was expecting Abyss to make a run-in. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. You know what? I didn't even think of that. I think everyone... I know there were a lot of reports. Like, a lot of a lot of the online experts said, well, you know Abyss will make an appearance this week, or uh, th- th- this Sunday at Battle for Glory, since his little brother's been kidnapped, you know, and... Everyone, like all the experts, said, "Oh, Abyss will make a run, and Abyss is definitely making a run." And so, yeah, that's kind of the shocking expectations. Um, I'll be right back, guys. Okay, all right. Well, we we might as well move on. James will be back. We might as well move on to the main event, which was Austin Aries versus Jeff Hardy. And something happened here that I was really worried about. It, it it was better than I thought it was going to be, but I, I was so worried about it. When they made it clear they wanted Aries as the heel, my thought was, well, here's the thing. What happens if, when you get out of the impact zone and the same 13-year-old girls that show up every week, what's going to happen when those people aren't there to pump up Jeff Hardy's pop? And the crowd very clearly was in favor of Austin Aries. It wasn't oh, yeah, like definitely, definitely. It was, yeah, it wasn't even like 60-40. I would say it was about 80-20. That's how it came across to me. I I would say 60-40, and before anyone starts uh, angrily emailing me, yes, Jeff had his fans there. You could hear them. They got they popped at times, but the majority of that that match was Austin Aries' fans, you know, and just what they what they wanted him as champion still. And a uh, very good match. Uh, both these guys busted their ass again. I would say it's one of Jeff Hardy's better matches in a long time in TNA. Um, to be honest, I would have kept the belt on Jeff Hart. I screwed it up already. I would have kept the belt on Austin Aries. That said, this time last year, I was still crying my eyes out saying, how could they not put the belt on Rude? How could they not put the belt on Rude? And after lockdown, I was so indignant this year at lockdown where I was just like, how the fuck could they blow this? Those, they're idiots. They want me to hate them. God Damn it, TNA. And when I finally realized, I calmed down and said, okay, the bad guy won and I'm pissed off. And one thing that TNA's had done at their, at their bigger pay-per-views is the heel keeps escaping with the belt. So this is the first time in a while where a baby face has won the big one at a big show. So, I mean, I, I disagree with the title change, but it's not a disaster, I don't think. And I think it's, there's plenty of room to still move on and have a very good story after this. Yeah, and it's all about the follow-up here. I mean, I was half expecting Hardy to win the title anyway. I don't think it's a a major crime that Aries lost. It's not like last year where they built up Rude so well, and then we pay our money for this payoff, and it's like the worst payoff ever. Uh, there is no payoff. It, it was such an anticlimactic thing last year. But this year, I mean, we all kind of, I think a lot of us expected Hardy to win the belt. So even if you didn't like it, it was still an expected thing. Um yeah, I mean, personally, I, I don't like Hardy being in the spot, mainly because of his history, and I kind of I keep waiting for him to just fuck up. But, uh, you know, the match was very good. I thought Aries uh, carried the match and made it uh, very enjoyable. I thought the crowd was great in this match. They were This was the most, uh, at least as far as how it came across on TV, I'll ask James when he gets back. But uh, this is where it felt like they were the most lively, and that was really cool. So uh, you got a really lively and energetic close to the pay-per-view, and it, it turned out really well. Yeah, uh, I, 
I, I, I don't know, and I, this is something I, it's going to be interesting to see. I kind of like your opinion too, Patrick. It felt like when Hardy won the belt, I was expecting a massive amount of booze. I didn't hear that. So at the very least, I feel like maybe the crowd kind of warmed up to him at the end when, because it was such a good match, or am I just, I, am I just you know, biased? I mean, I, it felt like, I'm not saying that the crowd ever got to that point where they were like, Hardy, 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 but there wasn't like a big negative backlash when he actually did get the pinfall. Right, right. Um, uh, I'm sorry, well, guys, I'm back. Did you finish up on Hardy and, and Aries? Well, uh, yeah, pretty we, much. What were your thoughts on it? Um, we well, actually said, and I want to ask you about this, um, watching it live, I said that the, it felt like watching this match just was the most lively the crowd was the whole night. Is that true? Mm, the loudest pops came in the, in, in the Sting uh, and, and Bully Ray matches, believe it or not the loudest pure pops, but they weren't as lively because there was no, like, nobody knew who the hell the um, the guys were in Aces and Aces, so even when they came out, there wasn't much of a pop uh, uh-huh. or, 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 you know, a boo or anything like that. And there was no mixed reactions. This is the match that had the most ri- mixed reactions. Um, and, and, yeah, that they were, there was a lot of chants like Austin and Aries, and then the Hardy fans would go, sucks, and... And then there was let's go Hardy, let's go Aries, let's go Hardy, let's go Aries going on a lot. So it was a lot of mixed crowd, but honestly, and I do mean this, I would say Aries had a good 70, 30, or 60, 40 favorable, and Aries's pop was the most guttural, cheering from the heart crowd reaction of the night other than Hogan. Sting got the loudest uh, next to Hogan. But Aries had the most sustained, legitimate, I'm sticking with this guy no matter how, who's cheering for him uh, or booing him reactions of the night. And there was chance, even before the show started, in the uh, outside the doors waiting for the doors to open, of Austin Aries that were you know, very loud, very passionate, very deafening. So Austin Aries actually was way more over than Hardy, way more. I don't know how that came across on TV, but it wasn't even close. It, it, it came across on TV. Like, it definitely was. It felt, yeah. What's that? On on TV, it came across like you said that the, the fans were more behind Aries than they were Jeff Hardy. Yeah. I will give Hardy credit though, and I don't know if this made it to the TV because I haven't seen the end um, of the pay per view yet. But there was a kid there, probably I don't know, maybe five, six, seven years old. Full blown Hardy makeup and and everything Hardy, and he actually brought him in the ring with him during the celebration. I don't know if that made TV or not though. It, it I, did not. Okay, that yeah. was actually very cool. That's that's the only time I cheered for Hardy that entire night because that was very cool. You know that made that kid's life. You know that was right. That was probably awesome for him. So yeah, he went over and picked him up out of the crowd and brought him in the ring, and the kid just was. Not going nuts. The kid even got up on the middle turnbuckles and was doing the Hardy pose. It was very, very cool. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's actually kind of cute. Yeah. But I heard this one. Apparently, PW Torch said that this match sucked because there's no confetti at the end <laughs> for uh, Hardy's title. No pyro, no pyro, no confetti at the entire event. I was very surprised. Well, I have to ask this, James. You said that the arena, the arena only hosts about, what, 5,000 people, right? Yeah. Okay, and I know that, I th- from what I understand, they actually released more tickets and had to re, like, revamp how they were going to do seating at the venue. So I'm wondering if in order to fit in more seats, they had to kind of ixnay back to the, the places where you could set that off. There was a spot in the back. We walked around the entire arena inside and out, and there's a spot at the back where you can actually like be standing right behind the video wall on the second level. And and if they were going to do something, that's where you would have done it from. Uh, one of my favorite bands is a band called Great White, and about 10 years ago, just shy of 10 years ago, February 2003, they had a state. It's called the Station Fire. 
It's when uh, over 100 people died and a couple hundred others ended up maimed for life, several of them blinded. Um, in fact, the guitarist of the band at the time died in the fire. And uh, to that band's credit, they still send his girlfriend at the time, who was pregnant with their kid who never met his dad, they still send her a paycheck. So, the, you know, it was a horrible fire. And it all stemmed from the fact that they used pyro, which was approved by the venue, um, that ended up igniting some of the uh, insulation that ended up sending the place ablaze within five minutes. I mean, people didn't have a chance to get out. My only thought is because the venue wasn't as huge and the ceilings wasn't as high as, say, I won't say the impact zone because I think it was higher than the impact zone, but it wasn't as high as some of the WWE arenas. Maybe they didn't get clearance from the actual arena owners themselves to do pyro or to do any of that kind of fancy stuff. That's the only thought I had. Maybe they had that in mind. Had the, you know, if it's all a fire hazard, they can't do it. Right. Well, also, I had to ask this. I don't know how often TNA, when they're on the road, does use pyro. I'm sure they've used it at some events, but I'm not sure if in other places they've, they've used it. Actually, there's a funny clip at one of the road pay-per-views um, I don't, I don't remember which show it was, but Rob Van Dam came out for his entrance, and he was clearly expecting pyros. And when none happened, he was like, what the hell? Which I, I can't believe it, either nobody told him that there was going to be no pyros, or he was so high, he just didn't realize it. <laughs> I could see either one happening. Yes. Um, but yeah, that, that, I was a little bit disappointed, because I was looking forward to you know seeing the fireworks and all that, but... You know, the, the roof wasn't that high. The, the venue was, um, it, it's a basketball venue for the college basketball teams. If you picture maybe double the size of your high school auditorium, probably about that uh -huh. size. It really wasn't huge, but it was big enough. And our seats weren't considered floor seats, but we were like a half step off the floor, if that makes any sense. You know, my right. feet could touch the floor from where we were, and that's I'm not kidding. We were the second row in. And I had no seats in front of us. Um, there was only, like, lawn chair seats in front of us. So my feet actually were on the floor. So it, it was really small. Uh, but it could hold 5,000 because it was rounded off. So, I mean, I do, I'm do. i not going to doubt the figures. You know, I saw somebody, you know, project 3,800 people there. I think that sounds probably about accurate. Right. Which, let's say this. Um, that's, a good, that's a great crowd for TNA. Uh, you know, why TNA is clearly the number two company in the world, it's still not anywhere near as big as the number one company. So, I was, it... The best that, thing about it, though, yes, it was a great number for them to draw, but what also was great was it wasn't just a bunch of people who were showing up for just the legends. These people right. were into everybody. There was no factor of, who the fuck is that guy? There was none of that I stuff. think that yeah. happened at lockdown. I think so too. I really, and I think it happened to some degree last year at Down for Glory, because there wasn't an impassioned response for Rude, and there should have been. Yeah. Well, say this: I, I almost feel like if TNA wants to run in the same uh, general area every every week, move to the south, because between the Slammiversary crowd and the lockdown uh, and and the Down for Glory cloud, two of the best crowds they've ever had. I, I, right. Well, the crowd in Texas was awesome. I mean, that that and uh, the crowd at Phoenix, Arizona, was pretty good as well. So, um, that's two good road crowds in a row. So, good for them on, on that front. Uh, I keep waiting for them to run a pay per view out of New York, though. Like, I can't believe they haven't run a pay per view there. Try Hammerstein Ballroom. Try if it's still open, the Elks Lodge. Both of those places were ECW mainstays that were actually too big of a run for, for ECW to to handle at times. Um, but I think TNA would have no trouble filling it with that, you know, overinflated wrestling audience that's in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Maryland, Delaware area, Philly area. You know, that whole cluster of the Northeast that has that huge wrestling population. I think that they would do a very good crowd. Mm -hmm. I I agree. How about you guys? I'm kind of surprised they haven't tried doing it in New York. I, I mean, I can't think of a reason why they wouldn't. My only thought would be maybe they just do to the subway and they're afraid to go up north for that. Like, there, there might be this weird fear of, well, 
what if we go up there for the big paper and we don't draw very well? Well, they they have run live shows there, and they drew very well. Uh, it, you know, for them, I mean, they they were some of the higher attended house shows that they've ever done. So again, why wouldn't they do a pay per view there? Well, if we ever get one of the TNA like officials on there, we need to ask them. Yes, sounds like a plan. Which, which you know, I look forward to if we ever get to interview again, Jim Cornette. Yeah. One interview I might actually get active for, because my first question will be, so Jim, you kept swearing that you were going to use the logic of the 80s with wrestlers that were born in the 80s, so why the hell did you hire Fit Family, Lance Storm, and Rhino? But, uh, yep, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, uh, yeah, that's gone for glory, and overall, I think we all really enjoyed it. It sounds like James and his family had a really great time at the live event. I know James, or I know Nick really loved the show, and I enjoyed it as well. And uh, is there any final thoughts before we sign off? I, well, is there anything else in wrestling you want to talk about? I mean, we, we got the confirmation that uh, Dave Hungry is going to get a world title shot. I, I warned you guys, and he's going to win the title. I'm warning you right now. I mean, I, I would have to, because I'm thinking right now, it's because they want to do Punk and Rock at the Rumble. That's pretty obvious. Um, unless they save it for Mania, which I'd actually prefer, to be honest. Unless they have Punk and Austin lined up, but who the hell knows. Uh, but, uh, you know, okay, Punk loses the title here. Is he just going to win it back in December? Or if Punk wins, are they just going to have him end Ryback's undefeated streak? I don't know if they want to do that. I, I really don't know what they're doing here. I guess it's interesting from that aspect. But my problem is I have no faith in the performer. And that's what it comes down to. And, you know, we could talk about how limited Goldberg was as a worker, how limited the Ultimate Warrior was. And they certainly were. I mean, they were, these were not technical masters. But they were presented in a way that made them exciting. Um, and Warrior had this outlandish, just insane as fuck character that really worked. Goldberg went out there and murdered people in cool and inventive ways, and it worked. Right back, he wins all the time, and he wins in, in dominant fashion, but it's the same goddamn match every single time. It's just, yeah. you'll sell a couple moves, clothesline, maybe one other move, and then he hits that stupid Simone drop, and that's it. Yeah. Which, uh, hey, Patrick, I hate to say this, I mean, you're like, you're, 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 you're a really good logic for why Ryback might not win the belt, but this is the WWE. I mean, this is the company that said, hey, you know what we should do? We should have Alberto Del Rio win the WWE title from CM Punk. That's a great idea. And just one year ago, I mean, yep. with the or Sheamus. I mean, Sheamus was the worst, probably. I mean, you want to talk about coming the fuck out of nowhere and winning a belt? And I'm talking about when he beat Cena back in '09, was it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, you want to talk about the like biggest what the fuck title win of all time? That was probably it. Yeah, and this will top it. I, I honest, I, I, I keep making this comparison because I think it's very apt. December to Dismember, the one standalone pay-per-view, um, the relaunch ECW got after the after um, if you don't count the two uh, um, hard uh, extreme uh, one night stand pay-per-views, the they uh, when the, the main event was a elimination chamber, but it was pretty clear it was going to come down to Lashley versus Big Show. In that show, they clearly wanted Lashley to be the big baby face. Oh, yeah, Big Show, you're finally going to get yours. The crowd started chanting for Big Show in that match. And they also started chanting T and Well, my favorite part is when they started chanting, where's our refund? Yes. That was an actual chant during the main event of a pay-per-view. Where's our refund? I think, you know what? I think it could happen again. Because they're going to get in there. And Ryback is so limited. What are they going to be? Punk can only get so much out of this guy. And I will, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Punk is, he's really got his work cut out for him. And I think 
I, you know, I, I was watching Dolph Ziggler on Raw this week, and I'm thinking, this dude's a bump machine, and they did nothing with it. They did nothing. And it's like, look, you have a guy who bounces around like a rubber ball, and you have a monster guy that you want to make look like a monster, and you did nothing with it. It was like, well, okay, same boring old Ryback match. So I, I don't know what's going to happen that tell the cell this, or yeah, I guess it's in two weeks. Yeah, by the way, um, going back to Alfred Warrior real, real quick, in the main event, there was a spot where Jeff Hardy picked Aries up for a power, looks like he was picking him up for a power bomb, and he tossed him over his head. And I have no idea what you call yeah. that move, but it was like, get it him. Like, I've seen it I don't before. I think it, I've seen it in video games. They call it the alley oop, which is a stupid name. But yeah, it, it did look sick. I think they were trying to go for like a snowplow or something, or a, a, a god, or is that. But yeah, I mean, it's like that, that's one of those moves only like a guy like Air Reese could pull off because he's so athletic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, and. uh I mean, Ryback, I mean, I'll be honest, the only one of his matches that I really remember is the one where he fucked up, and he couldn't pick up Tensai, and that was like, that was a fail of monumental proportions, so I, I just don't know, I like, I, you, you know, um, I, I like the idea of them trying to recreate Goldberg, I just don't think they've done it that well, and I don't think that this guy is the guy, I just, I just don't see it. Well, I, I hate to say this, there are so many better options out there to do it than this guy. I mean, you know, I know they're trying to make Punk a heel, but you know what? He's still over enough. I think with the fan base, you could you could you could put you know someone like Ziggler in there again. You know, it wouldn't be the greatest match in the world, and it, it'd have very little story behind it, but it'd be better than this. It's just like it, 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 it's just a horrible situation. I think mean, it just kind of exposes how thin the roster is, and I actually have to go now, Patrick, so uh, I'm going to sign off right now. All right, well, thank you, Nick. It was great hearing from you. It was great doing the show with you. And, uh, James, are you there? Are you back on the line? I will take that as a no. Okay, so I'm all by myself here. So for, uh, it was great to hear from James Walsh. It was great to get his thoughts and feelings on the Bound for Glory show, and it was cool to get the real live experience for him to come on here and share the live experience that he had. Um, and thank you for Nick for joining me as well. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back for more here at Internet Wrestling Radio at WrestlingEpicenter.com. Until then, peace out, everybody. All right, guys. Good show.